Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Batra Daf Tefav. Today's stuff is sponsored by Julie Mendelssohn and Edina Hajej in loving memory of their dear friend Yosef Yifrach Zichron Levracha, who passed away suddenly last week. Yosef was a wonderful man who loved his family and toiled in Torah as well as in the law. Just a few weeks ago, he spoke at the Beit Knesset about his love for Daf Yomi, encouraging everyone young and old to take up the Daf. He was thrilled that he recently finished his first year of the Daf. We'll keep learning in your memory as long as we can, sending love and strength to the family. Okay, we're going to get started today um, with... We're in the middle of who wrote the books of Tanakh. Basically, the structure for today is going to be really dealing first issue with who wrote the books of Tanakh, and particularly when it mentions someone dies in a book, if they were the author, how on earth were they writing about how were they writing about their death? So we'll deal with a bunch of books where that happens, and we'll have to figure out who finished the book. Then we're going to get to Eov, and we're going to have a whole huge digression into talking about Eov, a fascinating book. Who was Eov? When did he live? And they try to put him in a historical context. Many different varying opinions. We'll talk about what is the motivation of the rabbis to try to put him in a a place in history, because the book really doesn't seem to be placed in in any sort of time frame, although we'll we'll talk about that. And then at the end of the daf, we'll get to sort of the story of Eov, which is what happens in the first chapter. There's a discussion between Satan and God, and what exactly was the discussion and how did these things come about. So recommended reading for today is to go home and read the first few chapters of the first, you know, two chapters of Eov um, as background also for the continuation of what we're going to be doing. So we started at the bottom of our daf with who wrote the books. Okay, by the way, the uh, flashback went up yesterday specifically about both the writing of Torah scrolls and the order of the Torah and the differences that we were talking about yesterday. So you can read there in Shuli Mishkin's article uh, on our site about the, again, the different orders of the books and about scrolls. So Miktavan, Moshe Katavs, by the way, I wanted to just point out one thing that I noticed after class, which is I mentioned how one of the differences between our version and the version here, certainly when it comes to the Nevi'im Achronim, Yishayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, and Treasar, is that Ours is more chronological. Yeshayahu came first, then Yermiyahu, then Yechezkel. Um, but, and Treasar kind of finished at least, the, the last of the Nevi'im are there. It's chronological, whereas here it wasn't chronological. It was by Nechama, Poranut, if you remember. Um, but when it comes to the, the Ketuvim, our order is not chronological. Okay, our order is, right, we have the Sifrei Emet, Tili Mishle Iov, that's one unit. Then we have the Migilo, which go in chronological order, of kind of a more practical approach, how they're read in shul. Okay, we go in order of the calendar, and when we read those five Migilo. And then we have Ezra Nechemia, Daniel, Ezra Nechemia, Debrei Yamin, which chronologically are at the end. But the order here was actually much more chronological. It started with Root, which is in the time of the Shoftim. And then the whole order was, was very chronological, which in ours, it's not chronological, right? There, the Megillot were, inter, were, were interspersed throughout the Ketuvim based on when they were historically. So it's interesting that the Nevi'im Achronim weren't done in chronological order, but specifically the Ketuvim were. I guess the, 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 the tradition mentioned in the Gemara thought it was more important, the Puranud and all that, in terms of that, but when, you know, when, when you don't have any other consideration, then chronological was fine, whereas our order has a different concept of how to order the Ketuvim into different sections, and then within that, some sort of chronology, but again, not chronology of the content of the books, let's say, with the Megillot, but when they're read, practically speaking, in shul. So anyway, it's interesting to think about all the differences. So now we're back to who wrote what book. We have Moshe wrote the Torah and this Parshat Bilah and Eov. Yoshua wrote his book and the last eight books of the Torah. Shmuel wrote his book and Shoftim and Ruth. David wrote Tehillim and that's what we were up to. al Razkinim. He had some helpers though, so to speak, meaning he took things from that other people had written. Who were these people? The ten people. Adam Arishon, Malkit Tzedek, Al-Yideh Avraham, Al-Yideh Moshe, Al-Yideh Heman, Al-Yideh Dutun, Al-Yideh Asaf, Al-Yideh Shlosha Bnei Korach. And this is based on, okay, we'll have to deal with Avram. Everyone else is mentioned explicitly in one of those introductory psukim. In the f- first pasuk in a lot of the Tehillim, it says, Mizmor La Asaf, um, Rashi quotes a bunch, Lama Netzach Li Dutun, Maskil Heman, Tfilah Moshe. Okay, they're all mentioned in these, in these psukim. 
Adam Rishon, they say, um, is more a reference in Tilim Kuflamitet, is a reference to Adam Rishon. You can look there. So basically, they must have, you know, he collected things they wrote and wrote more on his own. Yirmiyahu Katav Sifro, his own book, you say for Yirmiyahu. Usually, the Navi wrote their books, although we'll see not everyone. This Sefer Melachim Vikinot. Okay, why? Because Sefer Melachim basically ends in the Chorban, the destruction. That's what Yirmiyahu was always, you know, that's the main thing of his book. And the keynote is Echa. He also wrote that because that was the lamentation for the destruction. Chizkiyahu Vesiato. Okay, he was a king. Okay, one of the, the good kings of the Judean kingdom who basically caught, got the people, like a reformation, got the people to learn Torah. So because of that, we give him the credit. He and his si'a, like his people, or yeshiva people call it, katvu yeshayahu mishle shirashirim v'kohelet. There's a siman yamshak. Okay, now, mishle shirashirim and kohelet we always attribute to Shlomo. But the point is Shlomo never wrote them down. Some people say because Shlomo went bad at the end of his life, right? His, his wives turned him away, and he just never really wrote these things down. He said them, but never wrote them down. So Chizkiyahu took it upon himself to get all, all of this written down. Anshi Knesset Hagdola Katvu. Katvu, okay, here's Kandag. Oh, Yechezkel, that's the kuf, because you can't use Yud, because Yud is Yeshayahu, Yemiyahu, that doesn't help you. Yechezkel Ushne Masal, Daniel Umigilat Esther. Okay, so Anshe Knesset Agdola, which Rashi tells us is Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, Zerubabel, Mordechai, and all those other people around that time. They wrote those books that are, again, their, their time period, Yechezka, which is already after the destruction, and Treasar, which at least ends with Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, even though the beginning is earlier, which we talked about yesterday. Daniel, which is from the time of after the destruction, when they were living in Babylonia, and Megillah Esther, which obviously is from then also. Ezra katav sifro v'yachas shel devrei ayamim ad lo. So Ezra wrote his own book, Ezra Nehemiah, and he wrote all the genealogy that's listed in Chronicles until it gets to Ezra. Okay, again, we have the same thing. Once someone dies, well, they obviously can't continue and write things that are beyond their life. Misayel el Rav. Now we're going to learn why Ezra wrote devrei ayamim. This supports what Rav said. Da amar Rav Yehuda amar Rav lo ala Ezra mi Babel ad sheiches atzmo va'alav. It's very important to him to write, to prove his own genealogy. If you remember, we learned about the whole thing, Asara Yuchsin and all that about, Ezra was very particular about who went to Eretz Israel, So he had to be particular about himself as well. So he wanted to prove that his lineage was good. And therefore, he basically wrote the book of Divrei Yamim with all the lists of who, who's who and who came from who in order to show that he was, that he had good yichus, that his lineage was right, was not flawed. And then only after that was he able to go to Israel. Okay, he, I mean, he said this for himself, but therefore he wrote the lineage there. Umay Aske, who finished it? Nechemya ben Chachalia. Okay, and Nechemya finished it up. Amar Mar. Okay, that's the end of the Brighton. Now we're going to fill in all sorts of things that are missing in this. So Amar Mar. Yoshua katav sitro shmona psukim shabbat Torah. So now we're going to say, here's a Brighton to support this. Tanya. Kimanda Amar Shmona Psukim Shabbat Torah Yoshua Ketavan, which means that we're going to see a brighter that says, you know, here supporting the fact that Yoshua wrote the last day Psukim in the Torah, but it seems clear here we're going to see an opposing opinion. Ditanya, Vayamat Sham Moshe Eved Hashem. So it says there, right, Moshe dies. Efshar Moshe Met, Kata Vayamat Sham Moshe. Could it possibly be Moshe dies? And he writes in the book, Moshe died. That would be very strange. Ela Ad Kan Katav Moshe. So basically, right, until there, Moshe wrote. After that, Yoshua finished the book. That's what Rabbi Yehuda says. Some people say it was Rabbi Nehemiah. How could it be that a Sefer Torah could be missing? Even one letter can't be missing. Of course, it wasn't missing. And what does it say in Sefer Tvarim toward the end in the Pasuk Perek Lame Dalid? I'm sorry, Perek Lamed Aleph. Lakach et Sefer HaTorah Hazeh. Okay, it says, right, you should take this Sefer Torah and put it next to the Aaron. We had that whole discussion yesterday. But Moshe is told, take this Sefer Torah. That means that in front of Moshe was a Sefer Torah. Now, you can't call it a Sefer Torah if it wasn't complete. So it must be that Moshe wrote the whole Torah, had it complete before him, even though it talks about his death. So, Ela Ad Kanakadosh Baruch Omer. 
There's two versions of this line, but let's read it and I'll tell you the two versions as we read it. Until this point of Yayama Chamoshe, God would speak, meaning dictate, basically. Umoshe Omer Vekotev. And Moshe would both say it and then write it. Okay, it's unclear whether Moshe would really say it or not, if that word is part of the text here. Some people take that word out entirely. And it was just that God would dictate, Moshe would, he would say it, Moshe would write it. Regular dictation. Not that Moshe actually said it. Okay, depends whether you have that gear or not. We're going to see what happened with those apes who came. Were they different in one way or were they different in two ways? Okay, if you say he also said it, then this next section he's not going to actually say. Or you just say he just wrote it and this section he, you'll see he wrote it a little differently. So, let's read it. And from here, Moshe would write it with Dema. Most people say Dema is tears, although there are a bunch of different interpretations. What has to do with dam, maybe blood. But anyway, let's assume it means tears. Moshe wrote it crying. Okay, there happen to be those psukim always make me cry when we read them at the end of Simchat Torah. It's um, the very powerful psukim, right? Moshe, it's the whole culmination of his life, and he doesn't get to go into the land, and it's very tragic. Um, and so they say here that God dictated, and Moshe wrote it by crying. Now, if you say Moshe said it and wrote it, then in this case, he only said it. I'm sorry, he only wrote it, he didn't say it. Or the only difference possibly is just that he wrote it differently, which is he wrote it well, with tears in his eyes. Some people say he actually wrote it with tears. The tears, instead of ink, he used tears to write it. That that's possibly what it means. Unclear, but they were written in some sort of a different manner. Now here we're just proving this concept of dictation exists, and we see it in Sefer Yirmiyahu. Okay, Yirmiyahu tells Baruch, his sofer, his scribe, to write things down. And it says here, So Baruch said to them, okay, And there it says, right, they, they would say, the, Yirmiyahu would say the words to me, and I would write it down with ink. So now we're going to say, okay, we have this machloket. We showed our bright old by Rabbi Yehuda or Rabbi Nechemia that Yoshua wrote the last Ape Sukim. The other opinion, Rabbi Shimon says, no, Moshe wrote the last Ape Sukim. Also, he just wrote them a little bit differently. So now they're going to say, according to who does the following source co correspond to? Shmona Psukim Shebatora Yachid Koreotan. Okay, the last ape sukim in the Torah, an individual reads them. There's many different interpretations of what this means. Either it means don't break them up. They have to be read as a continuum. Some people think this means you can even read them without a minion, or a minor can read them, or all different opinions of what this can mean. Okay, Rashi just says, Eimach sukim bahem, we don't stop in the middle. You have to read them straight. Okay, some people say Yachid is a unique person, meaning someone very special has to be the one who reads this section of the Torah. So there's a lot of different opinions. Whatever way we explain it, they stand out and they're different from the rest of the Torah. Lema Rabbi Yehudahi, Udiloka Rabbi Shimon. It sounds like perhaps this is like Rabbi Yehuda and not Rabbi Shimon because he said these ape sukim have a different status because Yoshua wrote them. And perhaps that's why, however we describe a yachi koreotam, we don't know, but right, maybe a little less so if you say a special unique person should read them, okay, but if you say they could be read without a minion, that would make sense, only Yoshua wrote them, they don't have the same sanctity as the rest of the Torah, but the Gemara says, no, I feel the Rabbi Shimon, you can explain it according to Rabbi Shimon, we have the Ishtenu, Ishtenu, in other words, everyone agrees these apes who came were different, different in what way, right, either because Yoshua wrote them or because Moshe wrote them while crying, either which way you could put them as a separate independent unit that has its own unique laws, and therefore it could be also according to Rabbi Shema. And now we're going to continue with all these other books, like Yoshua Katav Sifro, Bahakti, but toward the end of Yoshua, it says, Vayamat Yoshua Binun Eved Hashem. So what do we do with that? Daaske Elazar, right? We're always going to go to the next important leader of their time. So Elazar was next. Bahakti, but a few psukim later, we're now in the last chapter of Yoshua, it says Elazar bin Alamate. He also dies in the book. So who picked up after him? Daaske Pinchas. Pinchas picked up after him. Shmuel katav sifro, v'hakti v'shmuel meid, but doesn't it say Shmuel died? Now this is a little different than the rest, because Yoshua dies at the very end of Sefer Yoshua, as does Elazal. Moshe dies at the very end of the Torah. Shmuel dies in Shmuel Aleph, Perek Kafchet. There's still, right, the rest of Shmuel Aleph and a whole book of Shmuel Bet. That's a, bit, a big difference. 
Well, to ask a God of Jose Benatananavi. So they say the two prophets of the time, they were the ones who took over and finished the book of Shmuel. David Katav Sefer Tilim al Yedea Saraz Kini. Now we're just going to go back to that list and ask a question. Okay, we didn't really explain how we got to Avraham. There is no maskil la Avraham, la Mnetzeach la Avraham. There is no such thing. So before that, they ask a question. But you missed one. There's someone named Eitan Ezrachi. There's a Mizmor Tilim with his name in it. Amarav, Eitan Ezrachi, Zehu Avraham. And that solves our problem of where does Avraham appear and solves the question of why wasn't Eitan Ezrachi on the list because they're one and the same. Ketiv Hacha, how do we know this? Because it says here in, in Tilim, Eitan Ezrachi. There's a passage in Shayah, which they attribute to Avraham. And Avraham is who lit up the, from the east. Now, the Mizrach and Ezrach have the same letters in it, right? Just the Aleph and the Mem are switched. So they say Mizrach and Eitan Ezrachi is a reference to this Mizrach, is a reference to Avraham. Kachashiv Moshe and Kachashiv Heman. Wait, you list Moshe as one and Heman as another, but Hama Rav, Heman is Moshe. Rav says that Haman is another name for Moshe. If you didn't know this, according to Rav, Moshe had another name. It was Haman. Why was he Haman? What does Haman come from? Tiv hacha Haman. It says it here in Tilim. Uktiv hatam, and it says, um, oh, actually, no, there's a pasuk from Malachim Aleph. Sorry. Vayichkam mikol adam. This is about Shlomo, how smart he was. Meitana ezrachi vehaman vechalko vedardar b'nei mechol v'yishmo b'cholagayim saviv. Says Shlomo was wiser than all these men, and they say Haman there is Moshe. So now they say, how do we get to the it's Moshe? Because Moshe was the most Neeman to God, loyal. So therefore, his name was Haman, Mr. Loyal. So how do we answer this? So that Haman must be the same Haman in Tilim? Ah, no, it's not. Tre Haman Havu. Now do you understand? If you say Haman was Moshe in Tilim, then you have a problem because we listed 10 people. One of them was Haman and one of them was Moshe. They, they're one and the same. So we resolved that by saying there were two different people with the name Haman. The one mentioned in Sefer Malachim was Moshe. The one mentioned in Tilim was somebody else. Moshe Katav Sifro, this Parshat Bilam V'Iyov. Okay, now we're going to get on our big our big uh, topic of Iyov. Iyov Bime Moshe Haya. Okay, so this supports the fact that Moshe wrote Iyov is supporting... Right is supportive of this statement or helps support the statement of Rabbi Levi, who we're going to see disagree with a lot of people. There's a lot of different opinions about when Eov lived. It's like the biggest mystery. That Eov lived in the time of Moshe. And then it makes sense that Moshe wrote about Eov. Okay, because he lived in his time. How do we get that Moshe lived in the time of Eov? Well, we're going to say he used the same word that Moshe used, which is not the most common word. Although the Gemara is going to say, what do you mean? All sorts of other people use this word. And I think it's really interesting to think about where these words are used in the context of them. So the first pasuk is, Mi yitain e tipacha, in Eov it says, Mi yitain e fov milai. Okay? If I die, right, then, then what's going to happen with all my words, with what I did, with, right? I will have no memory. This is someone's, right, big struggle in life, that you leave your memory something. You leave something when you die. You know, who's going to, this is basically, you know, how will, I want there to be a legacy from me. Uchtiv hatam b'me yivada efo. This is, now, Eov is in a time of crisis, and Moshe is also, we're going to see that all these psukim that use the word efo are in a time of crisis. Okay, so the time of crisis here in Moshe is after Chet Egal, after the golden calf. Moshe says, um, right, God says, Panay yelechu v'anichot ilach, v'yom re'lav im ein panecho ochim al talen if you don't come with us, then don't come. Right, I don't, I don't want an angel or anything. Right? How will we know that we're, we found favor in your eyes? It's like a big question of faith. Okay, so that also, Moshe uses the same wording. That proves they must have been living in the same time. By the way, there's some theory to this, right? If you use a word that sometimes words are used in certain cultures, in certain time periods, and then they're not used in other time periods. So this is a way of proving Eov must have been living in the time of Moshe because of the wording that he used. Let me say, what do you mean? Emma bimei Yitzchak, dichtiv, mi efo hu atzad said. Now, where's this pasuk? This is in the pasuk when Yitzchak realizes that Yaakov took the bracha of Esav. And it says, vayecherad charadag dolam right? He, he got very, you know, he shook 
Big tremor of Ayomer, me efohu atzad said. Vayavili, right? What happened? I was tricked here. I can't believe this happened. Okay, also in the time of Christ, a very strong word apparently. Ve'ema bimei Yaakov, you could also say lived in the time of Yaakov. Dichtiv im ken zot asu. Okay, this is in the context of, um, right, um, this is when, when the, when basically they want to bring Binyam, Yosef says only come back if you bring Binyamin, and then they have no food left, they, right? Ya- Yaakov doesn't want to send Binyamin. He says, fine, if you have no choice, then this is what you should do. And he says, you know, go down and, and I give in. Okay, but also in crisis. Um, next, ve'ema bime Yosef dechtiv efohem ro'im. This is an interesting one. It's not exactly Yosef's in crisis right now, but Yosef is sent by his father to his brothers, and then he can't find them. Right? Where are my brothers? He says, and then the crisis comes after, right? Which is when they throw him in the pit and he gets sent to Egypt. So they say, okay, why not? Why do you assume that Moshe and not any of these other people? Lo sakadat. It doesn't make sense. There would be any of the other ones. The continuation of that pasuk is, right, I, I wish it would be able to go in a book and be like chok, like become a law or become, you know, in, etched into it. And Moshe is also called a mechokek. So there we see another connection between Eov and Moshe. This is the bracha to God, where he's told, right, it says, he was the one who settled first. Remember, he settles in the Transjordan area, and that's where Chalkat Mechokek Safun. That's where the, the plot of the Mechokek is hidden. That's Moshe who died. Okay, so there's a reference. Moshe is called the Mechokek, and Eov uses that language in his Pasuk, and that connects him. Rava Amal, Eov Bime Miraglim Hava. Now, this doesn't necessarily disagree with Moshe, but it's connecting him to the Miraglim. Okay, and it seems here by putting Eov, in a certain context, we're also seemingly connecting him with a certain person. That We want you to associate Eov with Moshe. We want you to associate Eov with the Maraglim. What's the connection of Eov to the Maraglim? Well, Eov and was in a crisis of faith, as were the Maraglim. And the message of the, of the story is there's a bigger picture out there, right? There's, there's something you don't all see. And, and God is orchestrating all of this. And it's the same message of the Maraglim and a very similar message in in uh, Eov. Now, how do we connect it technically? Interesting connection. K'tiv hacha ish haya be'eretz utz Eov shmo, right? He came from the Eretz utz, and his name is Eov. U'k'tiv hata hayesh ba'etz. One of the things they're supposed to check in Israel is, are there trees? Eitz utz. Okay, you might say those are two very different words, which in fact the Gemara says, mi dami, are these similar? Hacha utz, hatam etz. Two different things. This is what Moshe really said to Yisrael. There's a person whose years are long like a tree. Okay, basically, Eov lived a very, very long life. Okay, and he protects his nation like a tree. And I want you to find this person when you go to Israel. That's what he was asking. Okay, which, which basically is interesting also. It puts him in in Israel at the time. He's living in Canaan, okay, in Canaan. And, right, it seems like he's not really part of the Jewish people, according to this, which we're going to see. There's also a debate. Was he Jewish? Was he not Jewish? Um, okay. Now, a certain rabbi sat before Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani and said, Why are you having all these discussions? When did he live? Yov didn't live at all. He never was. Okay? The whole book is just a parable. Wasn't a real person. Amarle, so Shmuel Bar Nachman, he doesn't like this. He says, Alecha Amar Kra. What do you mean? It's for people like you. The Pasuk says, Ish haya be'eretz utzi of Shmo. We take this literally. He was a person. He lived in Eretz Uz. Eov was his name. He was real. El Ameatas, the, the rabbi, says to him, V'larash en kol ki'im kipsa chat k'tana asher kana v'yichaya, etc. This is what we call kips, the mashal of kipsa tarash. This is after David sins with Bathsheba. The Navi comes to him and says, you know, it's like, I, you know, there's the rich person and the poor person and the poor person, this is all he has and you took it away and, you know, this was his one wife. You took her, her away from him and it's this mashal. Now, it never really happened. It's a parable. It's a story. But it describes there was a kivsa, there was a rash, there was a poor person, there was a bit. It describes it as if it was real. So, same thing with Eov. To which they say, right, mihaya, of course, that didn't really happen. Ela mashal ba'alma. It was just a mashal. 
Hachanami, Mashab Alma, same thing here. To which Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman, he gets in the last word, and he says, In Ken Shmo V'Shem Iro Lama. Well, then why did you need to have a name of a place and a name of a person if not to say this was real? Okay, and this is a really interesting question. And the rabbis really ask it, and we have a difference of opinion here when it comes to Eov. We don't really say it about other stories of the Torah, but this raises a big question. Are the stories in the Torah meant to be historical stories? Were they meant to be understood as parables? And people can, you know, take this far one direction, far the other, you know, both sides. No, everything was real. You know, some things could be understood allegorically, right? It's, it's a very big question that's really opened up from this small discussion in the in the Gemara. I want to go read a section that I put in the chat before class. I'll put it back in the chat again to look it up. It's from Moran Vuchim in the third, Chelek Gimel, the third uh, section in chapter 22. And the Rambam in Moran Vuchim basically says, Parshat Iyof HaMufla'ah V'Nifla'ah Yimisug Ma Sha'anachnu Bo Klomar Hu Mashal Lebe'or Hashkafot B'nei Adam Bashkacha. Basically, the Rambam says, this is a parable. Ukfar Yadat HaMarmar Achad Okay, so basically he says there was no place, there was no time, it was above time, it's just a concept, allegory. But then he says, one of the Chachamim said, another one said, we're going to see all these different opinions about Bimei David, he was Meolei Bavel, what are they doing, right? So, it, it, in theory, it looks like that goes against the Rambam's position. But he says, The Rambam has a really interesting approach. And he says the fact that all these opinions exist that put Eov in this time period or that time period or that time period is actually strengthening the fact that And he says, What they're really trying to say is, And there's a very powerful line. Whether he was or whether he wasn't, In other words, Eov's question is a question asked in all generations. And the struggles he had are struggles that people have in all generations. And that's why the rabbis tried to put him in all the different generations. And that all those opinions actually combine and they agree. Okay, which obviously they don't all agree because Rosh Hashanah clearly says, no, he lived in a particular time and he was real. But, all the, but what he claims is it's possible to understand all these different opinions is trying to put Eov into all different generations and saying that Eov really lives in every generation. Because again, he doesn't live at all. His message, it's a message that's a universal message for all time periods. And that's a very powerful statement, um, particularly living in the, the state that we're living in now where those questions are, are really asked constantly. Um, you know, with all our struggles in the war and people dying and, you know, how do we understand all this? And we're struggling with it. So it's something that all the generations really struggle with. Okay, let's move on and let's see the different opinions. Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Elazar da Amri Travayu. Yov me ole golahaya. He was with the people who are going, who, uh, who went from the Galut after the first destruction and they went back to Israel. Okay, which places him as a Jew going back to Israel. And then he went and lived in Tveria and had his Beit Midrash there. Made right? He had a Beit Midrash, obviously, because that's the way the rabbis view, right? He was this. Okay. Now we're going to bring three difficulties against the fact that he was from Olei Bavel. The first one is going to have an issue with the fact of the time. Okay. Yimesh no Tav Shal Yov, a different Brighta says, the years of Yov were Misha'ash and Nechnesu Yisrael and Mitzrayim Ba'ad Shiatsu. Basically, he lived. From the time they went into Egypt till the time they got out of Egypt. But that obviously doesn't place him later in history when the first temple was destroyed. So, turning now to Amabet, Gemara says, No, Ema Mish Kim Isha Ashen Echnes Yisrael the Mitzrayim Ba'ad Sha'ash Yetzu. That's about how many years he lived. He lived the lifespan of, that equaled the time that the Jews went into Egypt and the time they got out, which was 210 years. And, right, if I have the years right, I think it's 210. Yeah. And that's how long he lived. Not that he lived then, but how long he lived. Second source. The next two sources are going to seem to, to say, or really say, that Eov wasn't Jewish. If Eov wasn't Jewish, how could you say he was Meole al Gola? So, Meitive. Shivan Nabulu mit Nabulu Motaulam. There were seven Nabi'im that prophesied for the Gentiles. Now, we assume that means they were Gentiles who prophesied for Gentiles. Ve'eluhim, Bilam, Aviv, Bilam and his father were both prophets. Eov. 
And now we're going to do the four friends. Okay, I always like to say quote unquote friends. They weren't exactly his friends. They had a lot of not nice things to say about him. Eliphazet Hemani Bildad Ashuchit Safar Namativa Eliyub and Brachel Abuzi. Okay, a lot of Eov is these discussions Eov has with his friends. So they say, what you're assuming this is, these are all Gentiles. We know that Eliyu for sure was not a Gentile because Haktiv, he says he was Mimishpachat Ram, and that was a Jewish family. So, Ela, what it must mean is, they prophesied for the Gentiles, not that they were Gentiles, right? That's what it says even. They were Nibiyim Shenit Nabu Leumot Olam. So, obviously, Bilam and his father were Gentiles, but the rest you could say were Jews. So Hachinami, you could say the same thing, just like Elihu must have been a Jew and prophesied for Gentiles, also Eov, Inabui, Inabe, Le'umot Ha'olam. So now they say, wait, that's a weird explanation, because there were seven Yivim, according to this list, who prophesied for Gentiles. Atu kulu nevi'e mi lo inabu le'umot ha'olam, all the other, not, or I don't know, all, but many ones also prophesied for the Gentiles. Okay, I'll give you the, the main one, Yona, right? He goes to Nimbe, that was his whole job. So, and it's a little bit of difficulty. You'd have to say Yonah had a lot of other prophecies as well about the Jews because otherwise this doesn't make sense because the answer is These seven were were the main prophecies they had were for the Gentiles whereas other prophets might have prophecies for Gentiles but also prophesied a lot for the Jews. Their main job was for the Jews, a little bit to the Gentiles. These people, their main job was to prophesize for Gentiles, and then you could still say he was Jewish. Third difficulty, Okay, this one's going to have a hard time reading it any other way. Right, we know that from the Holocaust particularly, right? These are Gentiles who, righteous Gentiles who helped the Jews. And his name was Eov. This is an interesting approach to Eov. We're going to see a different approach later. As you might know, you might not, but in Sefer Eov, Eov has a lot of complaints against God. And the question is, were his complaints said in an okay manner or not really in an okay manner? Was it okay that he did that or was it not okay? So we're going to see later a different source, not today, that it was okay that he did it. This source says, no, it was bad. Now you might say, what do you mean? It says, so that he be rewarded. But we're going to see the reward is a bad thing. So God brought bad things to Eov that we know happens. He starts to curse God, right? Those are the bad things he said about God. Well, once he did that, God said, fine, I'm going to punish you. How am I going to punish you? I'm going to give you any reward that you were deserving of for your previous life <laughs> before you sinned. I'm going to give you all those rewards in this world so that when you get to the next world, you'll have nothing left and you'll go to Gehenna. Okay, we've seen this, this type of punishment before, right? Or this concept that it, you know, push off, you know, you'd rather not have your reward in this world so that it's saved up for the next world. So it's the same concept here, we're just using it in the reverse. So this opinion, okay, this is just, it happens to be, he was Gentile, they say, and he was good to the Jews, but because he said these bad things about God, God actually punished him by rewarding him, right? The reward is the, at the end of the book, when Eov gets back all the things he lost, which of course doesn't make up for all the things he lost. It's not like, okay, right, but he gets more and that, and it's supposed to make up for what he lost, even though obviously it doesn't make up for a lost family, but, um, but he does get rewarded. And all those rewards really were saying were a bad thing. So how do we resolve that source with the fact that he was Meoleo Gola? To which the answer to Nahi, it's a machloka tanaim. And now to get to the machloka tanaim, we're going to see a whole bunch of more opinions about when Eov lived. Titania, Rabbi Elazar Omer, Eov bime shvota shoftimaya. Okay, only at the end of this we're going to get to how do we see that there's a machloka about whether Eov was Jewish or whether he was not Jewish. And that's in the end what we're going to show from this source. So Rabbi Elazar said, Eov bime shvota shoftimaya. Okay, he lived in the time of judges. How do we know this? Shenema, hein atem kuchem chazitem, lama zehevel tehabalu. Okay, this is another passage from Eov, chapter 27. It says, you all chazitem. Okay, we're going to see what this root means. It means to see, but see could mean a lot of different things. The lama zehevel tehabalu. Why are you, you know, going after hevel, useless things, bad things? We'll see what it could possibly mean. Anyway, Ezedor Shekulo Hevel, what's the generation that's full of this Hevel, like nothingness? Hevel Omer, Zedoro Shel Shvota Shoftim. 
that's the time when the judges ruled because we know, right, there's that terrible cycle and the Jews keep leaving God and there's chaos, right? Hevel is also kind of like chaos and that's really what there was in the time of the Shoftim, so he must have lived then. Rabbi Yeshua ben Korchomir, he lived in the time of Achshverosh. How do we know this? Another description of Eov. His daughters were the most beautiful in the whole land. Okay? And they couldn't find anyone more beautiful than these women. Why is that a reference to Achashverosh? Because how would you know if there was no one more beautiful, that people couldn't find anyone more beautiful? When were they looking for beautiful women, the most beautiful women in the world? Well, what generation were they looking for beautiful women? And they looked everywhere to find the most beautiful women. So now you can say, it must be his daughters were known to be the best in the land, the most beautiful, because they had actually checked and found all the women that were beautiful. A might be made David. You could still say maybe he was in the time of David. Dichtiv, when David's about to die, he's very cold. It says, They find this beautiful woman to warm his body. And there you have it. They, they looked also for beautiful women. So can't you say it was in the time of David? There they only looked in Israel. Here they looked in all of the land. Okay, and then in Achashverosh's time. And that's why you can say that it was in the time of Achashverosh. Rabbi Natan Omer. Okay, he was in the time of Machut Shva, which is in the time of Shlomo. If you remember, he meets with the, the queen of Shva, of Sheba. And we're going to talk about her soon. Okay, What happens in the first chapter, and that's why I said I really recommend you read it. We're going to read through a bunch of the Psukim. But in the beginning of Sefer Eov, after the Satan has this whole discussion with God, which we'll get to at the very end of today's stuff. Basically, bad things start happening, and this we'll get into tomorrow. And you start to see that bad things happen. So one of the psukim, the first psukim, I think, where the bad things start happening, it says that the people from Shva came and, and attacked. Okay, and then we're going to see the Kastim came. The Kastim were the Babylonians who lived in the time of um, the destruction of the temple, the first temple. So they're going to basically try to put him in each of these time periods when there were Shabaim, which are the people from Shva, Batipol Shva Batikachem, so that must have been in the time of Shlomo, Machut Shva, Chachamim Olim, Iobime Kasdim Ayah, he was in the time of the Babylonian when they ruled, Shenemar Kasdim Shamush Losha Rashim. Okay, so this puts him in all different historical time periods. The Yeshamrim, Iobime Yaakov Ayah, some people say it was in the time of Yaakov. Vidina Bat Yaakov Nasani married Dina. Okay, why Dina? Well, Ktiv Hacha, now his wife in chapter 2, when all these bad things start happening, she starts complaining and says, why don't you just curse God? And he responds to her and he says, why are you speaking You're speaking like a nivala. Okay, like a, like a, you know, nivala is like a very bad word of, uh, I can't think of the exact translation, but by Dina it says, right, the brother said, we stood up for Dina, ki nivala asabi Yisrael. A lo- okay, thank you. A loathsome act was done. Okay, you can translate it that way. So basically, you're speaking like a nivala and, and Dina the reference is she became a Nivalabi, right, because of what Shechem did with her when he raped her. So there you see the connection of his wife. He called her a Nivala, and Dina was called a Nivala. Oh, must be they're the same person. Um, okay, now why did we bring this? You probably forgot already. We brought this because we wanted to show the fact that one source says he was from Olea Gola, and the other source says he was from, uh, he was a Gentile. How do we reconcile that? How could he be both Jewish and not Jewish at the same time? debate among Tanaim. Now, none of these Tanaim said he wasn't Jewish. But, let's figure this out. Kulu Tanai Sviru Lehu Di'iyo Israel Hava. All these sources put him as a Jew, other than Levar Mi Yesh Omrim. Who was the Yesh Omrim? That he lived in the time of Yaakov. Why? How many Jews were there in the time of Yaakov? There were Yaakov and his 12 sons. And Eov wasn't, right? And his daughter. Eov wasn't one of them, so obviously he wasn't Jewish. Di'isa Kedatach Me'emot HaOlam Now, how do we know all the others think he was Jewish? Didn't say anything. He just said what time period he lived in. Well, all the other time periods were after the time of Moshe. And, Batar deshachiv Moshe mishrai shechina alumot haolam. Once Moshe dies, there is no shechina anymore on Gentiles. Had, there was no prophecy, and Eov was a prophet. If he was a prophet, no non-Jewish prophets lived after Moshe. How do we know? Because Ha'amar ma. It was said, Moshe asked God that the Shekhinah not be on, the, on anyone else other than Jews, and he 
and God gave this to him. How do we know that Moshe asked this? Shneemar in the Pasuk we quoted before where he says, Efo, he says, Viniflinu anivamcha. You should distinguish us from the other nations, meaning only we should have prophecy and not them. And God gave it to him. Whether God gave it to him right then, here it seems to see God answered him after Moshe died. Because what about Bilam? Right? Bilam was after that. But some people say Bilam actually wasn't really a prophet. He was something like in between. Okay, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Dorosh Eliyov Shatuf Bizimahaya. Okay, there were a lot of bad things. People were engaging in licentious behavior. How do we know this? Shneemal. Hen Atem Kuchem Chazitem. We're going back to this Pasuk. Okay, we're basically right now, we took this Braita to use it to prove our point. Now we're just going in depth into a few things mentioned. So they mentioned that Pasuk. This shows they were all full of licentious behavior. Atem Chazitem. Lama Zeh Hevel Tehbalu. Uchtiv Shuvi Shuvi Ashulamit Shuvi Shuvi Binecha Zebak. This is about the, these men want to look at the Shulamit. This is in, in uh, Shira Shivim. Nechaz we want to look at you, at your beauty. So therefore, Chazitem must be from the language of to look in, in lust. Ema b'nivua. What do you mean? The word Chazitem is also used, this is why I said it's hard to translate. It's also used in Chazon Yeshayahu ben Amos, which is a prophecy, because they see, right? They see things other people don't see. So they say no, because it can't possibly be a positive thing like prophecy, because um, because it says lama zehevel teabalu lama li. Like, why do you need that then? That pasuk lama zehevel teabalu. What would you need that pasuk for? That's a negative, and that's in connection with the chazitem. It must be they were engaged in licentious behavior. But I'm a rabbi yochna. My dachti the yibim me shvot hashoftim. Why shvot hashoftim? If you take it literally, shvot hashoftim means the judges. You could say the judges were judging, or you could say the judges were judged. And here we're going to say a very powerful line. What was so bad about the door of that generation? Dor shofet shoftav. That the people judge the judges, meaning the judges were engaged in terrible behavior. And here they give two examples. Omer lo tol kesami benenecha. Omer lo tol korami benenecha. The judge says, take out this, this um, little twig from between your eyes, meaning you did something small bad. And the, and the person who's being judged says to the judge, you take out that beam from before your eyes. Okay, you are doing something way worse than me. Amarlo, kaspe chayal sigim. You have some impurities in your in your silver. Amarlo, and the, the person being judged says to the judge, "Sabach mahol b'mayim." Your wine is all full of water. You've you know you're you're really way worse than we are. There's a debate why one is worse than the other, and the silver it's not so clear. Amar Rishua Bar Nachmani, Amar Rabbi Yonatan. Here's a bit of a strange line. Kol omer makat shva ishaita eno elatoe. My Malkatshva, Malchutishva. If you think Malka, the, the Malkatshva was a woman, she wasn't a woman, she was a man. And Okay, I'm, I'm going to sort of translate this this way, you'll see. It doesn't actually say she was a man, so hold off one minute. Okay, but if you think she was a woman, you're mistaken. Why? Because what does Malkat mean? Malchut, it means the, the reign of Shvana. This is very difficult because in the Psukim that describe her, it's clear she's a woman. The Marasha says that's not what they mean. If you think she was a woman that wasn't important, you're mistaken. If you think she was called a queen just because she was married to the king, you're wrong. She was called a queen because she was great in her own right. And that's a whole different interpretation. Okay, now we're going to start with these psukim. Okay, you have to look in Eov chapter 1, verse 6. And it starts with the, the sons of God come to God and also the Satan is with them. And now we start to hear this whole story. So God says, where are you coming from? He says, I was wandering around the world. And he says the words, they don't quote the important words here. We're wandering around the world. And I was walking in it. Now, mitalech is going to be a reference to a pasuk in Avraham. You can make a lot of literary comparisons between Avraham and Eov. This is what they're starting to do in the Gemara. And in fact, if you know by the Akedah, there's a lot of Midrashim that say by Akedat Yitzchak that the Satan comes along and tries to stop Avraham from doing it and is very involved in that. Often, you know, many people believe that that's because they take the Satan from the Psukim here and kind of copy it into there. So, Amar Lefanav, what, what was really the Satan saying in this Pasuk? This is what the Midrash likes to do, fill in the story. I was wandering in the whole world. Avraham seems to be the most dedicated. That's the hitalech. Got okay now. Here's the reference because he was mitalech and Avram was mitalech. Now he was told, "Go walk around the land because I will give you the whole thing." 
And then what happens to Avraham? Even though God promised him the whole land, when it comes to burying his wife, he can't even find a place to bury her. He has to spend a lot of money, even though God said this whole land will be yours. And look, Avraham didn't start complaining. Now we're back to the Psukim. Have you seen my, my Evid Eov? He's amazing. So, Why did God think he was greater? Because look, the Psukim describe him as being greater. It's not why did Hashem, but how do we know? After the, after, at the Akeda, when he says, don't do anything to the child, right? I know that you're a Yurei Elohim. It's a big, much more description. He was a, a, a straight man, God-fearing, and kept away from bad. He basically, in, in simple words, where at the end of the daft, so I'll just say this very quickly, he would say, keep the change. Okay, he would hire someone and just pay them for, you know, a small job and give them the whole pruta instead of half a pruta. How it gets to the chenvani, you can look at Rashi. Back to the psukim. You gave him everything. So what do you expect? Of course he's going to believe in you. And then it says, So what does it mean? Anyone who got money from him, basically, right? The Midas touch, everything he touched turned to gold. He would always make money on all his business dealings. And his mikne, these are descriptions of all the great things that Eov had. They were, they, it was supernatural what would happen with his animals. Okay, the wolves kill the goats. By him, the goats kill the wolves. Okay, meaning his goats could protect themselves from terrible animals that would come their way. Okay, then God says, fine. Sorry, the Satan says, if you were to attack him, you'll see that he'll start Yivarecha, which really means to curse. Okay, you'll see. There's no way he's not going to curse you. Vayomer Hashem ala Satan hine kol asher lo biyadecha. Do whatever you want with him, but right with everything he has, rock elav al tishlach yadecha. But don't kill him. Okay, don't do anything to him. You can do to everything he owns. Okay, and then we'll stop here and we'll start with you know what's what then happens. Okay, so here we started with the the books and the order he wrote them, and particularly you know also when someone died who picked up after them. And then we went to Eov, and Hamosha wrote Eov, and then we had a large range of opinions about when Eov lived, right? Perhaps we said, we suggested this is a way of just trying to put Eov into every generation and showing this is a, you know, me'alazman, um, you know, basically not connected with time at all, even though it seemed like people were trying to put him into time and location, um, although no one really ever explained where Utz is, right? The Wizard of Oz was taken from that, by the way. Um, Anyway, and then, you know, we had, um, then we start to hear really the story of Eov and why the Satan, how the Satan gets God to basically test Eov. With that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a good day and we'll continue with Eov tomorrow.